Hi, and welcome to Wind Up. I'm Meg. And I'm Campbell. This is a Great Britain episode. We're doing a profile of Camel Valley. These guys are one of the oldest wine producers in the UK. They've been around for nearly 30 years. Founded by a former RAF pilot called Bob Lindo. His son, Sam, is now the head winemaker. And they're really pleased to have just been awarded a royal warrant, making them the first wine producer in the UK to achieve that accolade. And Sam, as a winemaker himself, has won a load of awards too. So these guys are seriously up the quality tree in the UK. As you'll hear, we had some audio problems, uh, both with wind and with rain. Because it's Cornwall. And it was very Cornish. Uh, so some of the footage that we had is, is just unusable. And there was some footage, like aerial footage, we weren't able to get at all. So we've still got uh, more stories to tell with these guys. And it's another excuse to go back, which we will do hopefully very soon. So we're going to introduce you to Sam in a second. He's a lot like his wines in that he's dry, crisp and appealing. You know, he is a funny guy. He's very precise on what he wants to do uh, in his vineyards and in his cellars. Uh, but he's really, really warm in character when it comes to people who come down to see Camel Valley. One of the things that we think is really important to us in Great Britain is that English producers find their own identity and don't try too hard to be French or to replicate champagne in their approach. So let's hear from Sam about how the guys at Camel Valley have found their identity. I think we all we all have our identity and it's it's really interesting in, in the wine industry people normally come from another industry because um, and it's kind of it's almost like well, in America do you buy a football team or a winery or yeah. you know it's that kind of thing. So people always bring with them a certain approach and a certain skill and they bring it to wine. So you know, if you're in international shipping you'll kind of have this other focus and um, so obviously my dad was in the RAF and I did maths at university and, and uh, so we've got this this other kind of approach that, that we bring with us. Um, and then in terms of being English versus other places I think that really being the underdog is part of our terroir and, and, uh, and the people behind it. Uh, it's sort of you know, really important. So it's, I think as soon as you, uh, you you don't have that approach, I think you probably won't be an English winemaker. Mm. So yeah, it's important for us to carry on regardless. And uh, uh, definitely, I think you've got to embrace what's unique about being here because uh, um, you know Champagne is a different place. It's a lot hotter. Yeah. There. Our grapes are on the vine 30 or 40 days longer after flowering than Champagne, yeah. um, and that brings it with us. That brings with it actually some quite advantageous um, uh, things that, that allow you to do things differently. But yeah, I think we've definitely not tried to have the um, you know, Champagne Trio varieties. We have Saval, which is the main white variety we have. And um, yeah, it's really important to do something different because there's no point in saying, oh, do you want to try this? And it's, yeah, it's just as, it's the same as Champagne. It's like, well, you buy Champagne. And, as marketers, we know it can be tough to find an audience. Let's hear a bit from Sam about how Camel Valley found theirs. All of those things about marketing and branding are, are very important, and, um, but it has to sort of be coordinated. Um, and so we've grown up from being really small and a you know, family business and not really knowing anything. And um, so when you visit here, that kind of family sense is sort of coordinated because you know, we've gradually added this on here and that on there and done it in our own kind of um, uh, in our own way um, and I think that uh, you know we'd like to think that kind of comes across um, with for people when they, when they visit and that's the message that they take home and people often you know other people in the English wine industry go oh you guys must you know who does all your marketing what do you do and we don't actually do any marketing uh, in the normal sense of, um, uh, of marketing but we we encourage people to visit us here and we show people around and we tell them how we make the wine and they taste the wine and they enjoy the wine um, and we've been doing that for 30 years. We've actually spoken to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and um, and I would say most people in the country have either been, uh, well, not obviously most people haven't been here, but a lot of people have been here. And so most people either know someone or are related to someone who's been here. Um, and so people really know about us. Um, and it is that it's been a real, I guess, a real slow burn. Um, but we started off with making a lot less wine than we make now. Um, 
And so that's been really important. And actually, all of our great listings that we've got, people are saying, oh, yeah, how are you getting the, uh, the Ritz, the Burge, uh, own label Fortnum and Mason, uh, Le Manoir, um, all the Hakusan, um, you know, all of those great listings and restaurants in Cornwall because people have been here and then they've gone off and uh, either they've had it at their wedding or you know, got into a restaurant and demanded that the restaurant serve it or uh, and you get this, yeah, you get these little pockets of cult following. So we've been fortunate enough to meet a lot of wine producers in different countries. What did you think of these guys? Uh, awesome. Awesome. I think it was my, or no, it was definitely my favourite tour that we've done of them all. Uh, not just because it was in perfect English, um, but the guy was super friendly and super approachable. They walked us all the way around from, you know, the grapes to pressing to everything and talked us through it. Um, and I loved that for the first time, I didn't feel intimidated at all about asking questions. Mm. And I think there were probably a couple of questions I asked that I've wondered for ages, or you'll know sometimes we'll leave a tour and then I'll ask you a question because yeah. I don't want to embarrass myself. Uh, so that was that was brilliant. I think the place itself was cool having the bar. So as right. long as you've got your uh, designated driver, you can stay there and uh, Which we sample didn't, all the wines. Unfortunately, unfortunately not. But no, I thought that was that was great, and I'd highly recommend it to anyone. A big part of the Camel Valley ethos is to talk to their customers. Let's hear a little bit more from Sam about this approach. Everything, all the wine that we sell not from here, you know, to the to the trade and, and away from here, is really due to the fact that people have visited here before. Um, and it's led to demand in other places, um, and and uh, yeah, I wouldn't know how to do it any differently really than, than that. So we're really lucky um, that, that that's how it's worked out for us. But also we enjoy it, um, and so we love showing people around. And you know, at the beginning, it was great to people really were really intent on not liking the wine. They just think, didn't think, you know, go well, I'll try it, but. Um, yeah, I'm definitely not going to like it because it's not from France or something. Yeah. And, uh, and so that was always great when people go, oh, actually, this is, this is really great. It's not like anything else. But it's, and uh, so that was always really good. Uh, and now we, you know, we make good you know, sparkling wine as well in a way that <coughs> people recognise. And, and so, yeah, it's always great when people enjoy the wine. The English wine scene is mainly known for sparkling wine, lots of comparisons to champagne and I think the quality stacks up to those comparisons, but they also make still wine. We think that it's important for the overall credibility of British wine that they make still, not just fizz. Uh, so we asked Sam for his views on that. Uh, I think speaking on, from our own point of view, it's really important that we do still and sparkling. Um, and because um, it's an easy way for people to get into Camel Valley is to buy a bottle of still wine if they really like that and then they venture out and, and yeah. um, buy the buy the sparkling. So it's it's important for us and also all of our wines are actually byproducts of all of the other wines. So it's important that we make all of it just to maintain the quality of everything. Right. Um, I think it's if you're if we only made sparkling from what we do, I think we would we would have less quality because you have to use everything, and the pressing would bring down the quality of the platform. And then, the, if you just made still one, then the free one would, then, you know, the higher acid platform, the still one would bring down the quality of that too. So, uh, yeah, I think England needs to make, needs to make both, uh, and it's fine to make both. So, you grew up around those parts. How important is it for you as a local girl to visit places like Camel Valley? It was great to see. I think great to see something in uh, not just Britain, but my particular part of Britain, um, to see that landscape covered in vines and to taste what that produces was fantastic. Um, it was also fantastic to meet Sam. I think he's very typical Cornishman as well. Um, there's a bit of a rivalry between Devon and Cornwall, but I love the Cornish. <laughs> um, and he's very super approachable, very laid back, um, had loads of interesting things to say. Um, but also kind of takes his craft very seriously and is very proud not just to be a winemaker but also to be Cornish. That's a big thing for Sam, as you say. So let's hear a little bit more from Sam about what Cornwall brings to the wine. I think in Cornwall actually um, is, is a great... You know, there's, lots of, there's lots of different branding hooks with wine. You know, what's on the label, the name, 
the taste of the wine, the shape of the bottle, there's loads of things. Um, and for us, Cornwall is actually a really important, important thing because of the food and drink culture in Cornwall. Um, it's, we, um, we just do the wine bit, but there's so many different aspects of food and drink in Cornwall. And I think when people visit Cornwall, they really understand that. And it's got a really good, great cachet for quality mm. food and drink uh, up and down the country. And even actually on an industrial thing, you know, we, we, the, the, uh, the McDonald's uh, breakfast bacon was made in Bobby. Uh, yeah, so it's... Uh, I didn't know that. Did not know that. Does that, does that go well with... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A good one goes with any food, by the way. Yes. Uh, so, and I think that, that so Cornwall is, uh, is yeah, I think it's a, it's a really great... Great thing. It's uh, yeah, much better than Devon. Yeah. <laughs> well, some you know the regional identity. Some parts of the country just don't have any regional identity. It's uh, or not for food and drink anyway. But Cornwall really does, and I, I like to think people know that. Well, that's literally uh, whetted my appetite. I'm now rather thirsty, so I think it's time that we taste Camel Valley's Cornwall Brut. Before we do so, mandatory wine bore facts. This wine is made of a roughly even parts blend of three grapes. Firstly, Chardonnay, secondly, Pinot Noir, and third, Ceval. Chardonnay and Pinot Noir will be familiar to you all, two of the three Champagne grapes. Ceval is the one that Sam mentioned in the VT, and chances are you've never heard of it and don't know too much about it. It's quite an unusual, quite a rare grape, it's actually a, a hybrid manufactured in, in America and it's been kind of purpose built to handle uh, questionable climate and potentially uh, quite a lot of water. In other words, it's kind of been bred for places like the UK and uh, where they grow wine in Canada and in the Finger Lakes in New York, places where it gets a little bit questionable weather-wise. So this is the Camel Valley. Uh, Brut, it's on their website, is uh, Cornwall Brut. This is, if you like, their mothership uh, wine. This is their main uh, cuvee, as the French say. So let's give it a bit of a, a whirl and a sniff. I'm very definitely getting the Chardonnay coming through there. It's very fruit forward. Uh, it doesn't have any sort of an edge to it. It was quite warm and creamy. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. I think that creaminess comes through. Let's give it a taste. Mm. It's really good. I mean, we've, we've had it before, but it's very clean. It's very crisp. It, it doesn't have the sort of dryness of a lot of champagnes. It doesn't have that edge to it. There's a really nice acidic backbone to it. Um, this, this is a wine producer who sort of specializes in making food friendly wines, particularly fish um, or fish and chips, um, as Sam's already referenced. And it's got a really nice acidic backbone that will cut through things. Again, I can imagine literally fish and chips with vinegar on it, this isn't at all vinegary, but it's going to set something of like that off um, really well, I'd say. Yeah, I think so. The thing I'm keen to emphasise here when we talk about acidity is that it doesn't, it's not that gross acidity that you get yeah. with cheap yeah, wine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it is really tough to explain though. Um, but yeah, the perfect kind of, it, it would cut through, sort of cut through and complement things. Yeah. Um, and very well rounded as well. Mm. well. Well, good acidity can kind of gets the juices flowing, you know, I'm, I'm salivating a little bit in a good way. Uh, I feel like I want some food now. So this would be a great aperitif wine in terms of exactly what an aperitif is designed mm. to do, as in prepare the mouth and the palate to eat. And I'm, I'm feeling like as soon as we switch off the camera, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a snack. Um, but I think, I think this is a beautiful um, wine. Um, Thoroughly recommend it to anybody who likes uh, fizz, period. Mm. Um, this is priced at £28 from Camel Valley as well as their own uh, retail outlets, or other people's retail outlets, rather. So it comes in slightly below what you're probably going to pay for a Grand Marc Champagne, mm -hmm. which these days is in the 30s, probably £35 is roughly what you're going to pay for a, for, a, for a fairly entry-level plonk uh, from Champagne. 
I'd say this outperforms that. I don't know about oh, you. Yeah. If you if we compare this to you know a Moet or a Lanson oh, or something like that. Oh, it's just stupid. Yeah, it would be stupid. Um, it is much fruitier. It's mm -hmm. it's creamier and smoother. Um, it's got more finesse. I think it suits uh, food better. Uh, how would you wedge this? Uh, I'm really struggling not to be biased. <laughs> uh, I think on the basis you say it falls short of your pricing for for a Moet, for example. Um, and far exceeds it, not just in taste, but also just in it's cool, it's from Cornwall. Um, great story to go alongside it. Uh, I want to give it a 10, but I'm not sure if you'd... I, it's definitely in the 9 or 10, because I wouldn't just recommend it to friends. I'd say yeah. go to Campbell Valley, yeah. go and have the walk around, and then buy their wines all the time. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, we, we reviewed the back is dry here uh, previously, and we gave that a 9. Uh, it's half the price of this, but this is the, the this is the sparkling. I think this is better wine. I think pound for pound, it will stand up to any sparkling wine at this price point from anywhere in the world. So yeah, it's a ten from me. A ten. I nearly said this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe we don't do that. Uh, wine tasting for children. That's what um, happens when you're teaching your son that. I know. <laughs> wine tasting for children. So this is a ten from us. And let's give the final word to Sam, who we asked him as a guy who's been around uh, for quite a long time now in the UK scene, what advice he would give to young winemakers. I'd just like, to, before I start asking that question, I think if I had to make wine, if I was in charge of winemaking in another country, I think I'd really struggle. <laughs> really? It's, uh, yeah, I think we're really good at making wine from the grapes that we get here, but I would really struggle to recognise what needs to be done in the new country. So. You know, particularly making red wine and things like that. So, uh, yeah, we built up our, our experience. Um, I think my advice to winemaker to a young winemaker is to really understand the context of the wine that you're making, where it fits culturally and locally, and the food and how it fits and everything else, because it's a really a symbiotic thing. You can't just make something that um, is is good, but in isolation of everything else that people do. So wine's often consumed with food in, in certain ways and there's a lot of uh, things that happen with wine and, and so yeah, I think you've really got to know and be able to help your customers know when and how to enjoy the wine. I don't mean it in a condescending way, but it's, uh, it's, it's really good when, you, when you're enjoying the right, wine the right way. So I always tell our customers to go and get some fish and chips. And that's it from us. Cheers. Cheers.